Hey guys, welcome back to Wrestling News 365. Hope everyone is doing very, very well. After AEW's Friday Night Dynamite last night, we have a ton of AEW news stories to get into today. So let's kick off with former WWE superstar Alistair Black, because Alistair Black reportedly is expected to sign with AEW. Big story here, considering there is now rumors about Alistair Black possibly going back to WWE. Obviously, he was released by WWE a couple of weeks ago. Now there's rumors about him going back. Now there's rumors he's expected to sign with AEW. What is going on? With Tommy End. Well, we have some information about that because former WWE superstar Alistair Black, Tommy End, is expected to sign with AEW. This report is coming from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. And that's significant, of course, that it's coming from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter because, as I've mentioned before several times here on the channel, when it comes to Dave Meltzer, when it comes to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, of course... People will always question the validity and the legitimacy of certain stories when it comes to companies like WWE, Impact, whatever, New Japan Pro Wrestling. When it comes to Dave Meltzer and the Wrestling Observer Newsletter reporting on AEW, arguably there isn't a journalist that has better connections to AEW than Dave Meltzer and the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Whenever there's a story from AEW that Dave Meltzer is reporting, 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's accurate. Why? Because Dave Meltzer has very, very, very close connections with Tony Khan. Now, he's mentioned several times before that Tony Khan grew up reading the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Dave Meltzer has even bragged on certain, certain occasions that uh, Dave Meltzer learned, uh, that Tony Khan rather le learned everything about booking and promoting from reading the Wrestling Observer Newsletter as a kid. So for the Wrestling Observer Newsletter to be running a story that Alistair Black is expected to sign with AEW, that's likely coming from inside AEW. That's likely coming from Tony Khan himself repeating that information to Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. So that's why it's a very significant story, this. So Alistair Black signing with AEW is not a done deal, but there is a strong belief that he will be signing with AEW, according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Now, of course, Alistair Black is under the standard 90-day non-compete clause with WWE right now. He's not able to sign with AEW or any other pro wrestling company, for that matter, until Tuesday, August 3rd. Now, it was noted earlier this week that there are people within WWE who are pushing for Alistair Black to be brought back to WWE. Now, Black recently appeared on the Oral Sessions podcast with Renee Paquette and expressed an interest in wanting to wrestle several AEW, Impact Wrestling, and Ring of Honor stars. We covered the Impact stars here on the channel. That included uh, the likes of Moose and Sammy Callahan. But other stars included Impact and AEW World Champion Kenny Omega, Christopher Daniels, John Moxley, Brian Cage, Brody King, Homicide, Eddie Kingston, and Jungle Boy. This is what Alistair Black had to say, quote, I want to get in the ring with Moose, Callahan, Mox, Omega, Christopher Daniels. My God, that is such an array of talent. Jungle Boy is great. I think Hobbs is awesome. Brian Cage, Brody King from Ring of Honor, Homicide. I would love to get in the ring with Homicide. Eddie Kingston is another one. Now, Black did also express an interest in signing with New Japan Pro Wrestling. He said, quote, I think it's no secret that I have a lot of love for New Japan. New Japan would be phenomenal. I love Japan. I miss Japan. Even thinking about it gives me butterflies. Never did I feel more like a professional wrestler than when I stepped off the plane at Narita Airport and I would go to the dojo and start training. It was great. We don't know what the future holds at this point. Well, I know certain points in my future, but I'm not going to spill the beans here. So, Alistair Black, the expectation from within AEW, which is significant. And again, the fact that the Wrestling Observer Newsletter are reporting this is significant because they do have strong connections to Tony Khan, to AEW. So I read between the lines. And that's what you have to do with these reports. You have to, whenever you get a report from any different outlet, this is what I always try and encourage here on the channel, is that you question it. You, you, It's like wine tasting with any story. You know, Any story is like wine tasting. You have to take a sip, sample it, and go, okay, what am I feeling from this? Do I feel that it's propaganda? Do I feel that it's real? Do I feel that it's false? Do I believe the journalists? What's their track record like? What's their track re record like with that company? All of that kind of stuff you have to read into. And with this one, again, I think it's, a, I think it's major. This isn't just a prediction. This isn't just a situation where people are saying, well, he's probably going to go to AEW. That's the most likely place for him to go. He'd fit in well in AEW. This isn't speculation at this point. This is belief from internally inside the company. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal. And the outlet reporting that, it makes it even an even bigger deal because of the close connections that they have. Because you can kind of see the conversation being had, can't you, between Dave Meltzer or who other Dave Meltzer's minions are, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, you can kind of imagine that conversation of reaching out to Tony Khan himself. There's no higher power in AEW than Tony Khan. So I'm reaching out to him going, Tommy End, and he's going, I think we're going to get him. 
And that's kind of the situation there. Now, as far as Tommy End, Alistair Black, as far as his desires to work with New Japan Pro Wrestling, that's not a problem in AEW at all, is it? Several talents on the AEW roster have it within their contracts that they can work with New Japan if they want to, whether it's Chris Jericho, John Moxley, even all of the EVPs, Cody Rhodes, Kenny Omega, the options there, the Young Bucks, the options for there for them to work with New Japan if they should wish. People like, of course, uh, John Moxley and Chris Jericho have been working with New Japan. I think Jericho's deal with New Japan has actually expired, but he's got unfinished business there, obviously. Moxley still the IWGP United States Heavyweight Champion. So, Alistair Black obviously could get it written into his contract that he could go to New Japan if he wanted to. The late Brody Lee, even when he came over to AEW, he was another guy that had it written into his contract that if he wanted to, he could work in New Japan. I think Alistair Black would get something similar. And to be honest, since Alistair Black was released by WWE, yes, there's been, and we spoke about it, possibly going to, you know, Impact, Ring of Honor, New Japan, all that kind of stuff. The feeling, the general feeling has always been, hasn't it, that he would probably go to AEW because that's where he would fit the best. That's where... His style, his striking style, just the opponents, the crowd, his sort of dark character would just fit so well. It just, everything fits, doesn't it? Everything fits, and he could just be such a megastar over there in Japan. And you think about the matches he could have with Nato, Okada, Will Ospreay, whenever he's healthy again. All of those guys, Minoru Suzuki, you know, the list can go on and on of guys that you'd be excited for him to face in New Japan. And it just, it just fits. Now, obviously, the situation now is with Japan is that... It's difficult. The travel over there, obviously the outbreaks with the pandemic, I think they're still in a state of emergency right now. So Alistair Black going over to Japan isn't going to happen anytime soon, not just because of the 90-day non-compete clause, but because of the, the other factors as well. But he could still appear on the New Japan Pro Wrestling Strong Show, obviously could appear for AEW. But now the sort of wrench in the plan here has to do with the WWE's renewed interest. And there is a feeling by some that this release from WWE is less of a termination and more of a renegotiation tactic. Let's um, get these guys out of the company, get them off the wage bill. We can bring them back, but at a lesser rate, certainly for the likes of Braun Strowman. I don't know if that's the case for Alistair Black, but look, it's significant. It's very significant. And Alistair Black in AEW, Tommy End with a bit more creative freedom and some of the matches he could have with the likes of Kenny Omega, the list can go on and on. It's very exciting. So who knows if that could happen in the future? Let's talk about some Dynamite special dates that have been announced. Of course, as I mentioned, it was Dynamite last night, and there was a lot announced during last night's edition of Dynamite. AEW has announced the dates of four Dynamite specials on the June 11th episode of Dynamite last night. The promotion revealed that July will feature Road Rager, two nights of Fighter Fest, and Fight for the Fallen. AEW had uh, held the latter two events in 2019, but could not in 2020 due to the pandemic. Road Rager will also be their first show outside Daly's Place in Jacksonville for over a year. It also marks the return of AEW to touring live on the road. So you've got, as I mentioned, Road Rager in Miami, Florida on July 7th. You've got Fighter Fest Night 1 on July 14 in Austin, Texas. You've got Fighter Fest Night 2 uh, on July 21st in Dallas, in Dallas, Texas. You've got, uh, obviously, Fight for the Fallen on July 28th, uh, which is in Charlotte, North Carolina. So, very interesting. Now, Dynamite, of course, has been taking place on Friday nights over the past three weeks due to being preempted by TNT because of the NBA playoffs. In two weeks' time, Dynamite will be held on Saturday, June 26th and will be headlined by Jungle Boy challenging Kenny Omega for the AEW World Championship. So, I mean, exciting, very exciting. My only thing I would say about this, and obviously it's very exciting because it's the return to touring, obviously. Um, notice those Road Rager is pretty much the same graphics. I mean, pretty much the same graphics that they used for Bash at the Beach back in 2020, which I think is interesting. But Bash at the Beach has to do with the Jericho Cruise, and that's a January thing, so I think that's just the situation there. But what I will say about this is, for, again, it's very exciting. AEW going back on the road, having these special events. They're obviously hoping to do big numbers, not just in attendance, but also in terms of ratings for TNT as well, especially unopposed on Wednesday nights. It's a big deal. The only thing I would kind of say, and we kind of did get this sort of last year as well, and I think it's a good point to, to bring up here, is that they did this last year when they had Fighter Fest and Fight for the Fallen, and it kind of got to a point with AEW. Now, I know they do four pay-per-views a year, quarterly, so you have to do these TV specials, but it kind of did feel like at points last year that every other week was a TV special, right? Whether it was Fighter Fest, whether it was Fight for the Fallen, whether it is Winter is Coming, whether it's St. Patrick's Day Slam, New Year's Smash, New Year's Bash, it kind of felt like every other week at certain points there was a special. Now, I'm not criticizing that. I think it's relatively smart in terms of 
you know, popping big numbers and building to events, especially, as I mentioned, when you've only got four quarterly pay-per-views, it makes sense. And you have to remember as well, AEW's original model was to have these four pay-per-view events, but things like Fight Fest and Fight for the Fallen initially were on BR Live. They were like BR Live exclusive. So do they go back to that? Only time will tell. The only thing I would just say is, you know, be be careful because there is a feeling of sort of oversaturation of having a TV special every week, especially for what is four weeks in a row. You're going to have a month of television specials. By the time you get to fight for the fallen, does it feel special anymore? I, I don't know. Only time will tell. Only time will tell whether this is the right thing to do because we're going to ha essentially have a month of no dynamite really i know they're dynamite specials but no traditional normal episode of dynamite we're not going to have that for a month and i don't know how that will affect things by the time we get to fight for the fallen are the numbers still going to be big because it's a tv special or does it just feel like another episode of dynamite time will only tell and it's going to be interesting because essentially they're doing for what they would call pay-per-view worthy cards week after week after week after week which I find interesting. Now, from a ticket point of view, it makes sense because having a TV special hopefully will drive up the ticket sales because I would assume the first couple of weeks will be fine for tickets, but after a, sort of a month in, that's when you have to really start to sell those tickets again. Maybe that's why they're doing night two of Fight Fest. Maybe that's why they're doing Fight for the Fallen. Time will only tell. But I think it's interesting and it's exciting. I love, I love TV special and it means uh, exciting cards of, of pro wrestling. So I'm all for it. But again, it's interesting. Is it overexposure? Are they cannibalizing their own, you know, their other TV specials later on? Because by the time we get to it, people will be tired. I don't know. That's that, That's the interesting part here. Speaking of Road Rager, we have a match announced for it, and it's a South Beach strap match. Cody Rhodes and QT Marshall are set to face off again. Yay. Um, on the last night's edition of Dynamite, QT Marshall interrupted Cody Rhodes' promo, taking exception with the fact that Cody said he was beaten by Anthony Gogo last week, despite the fact it was QT Marshall who pinned him. On that night, Marshall did score the pinfall, but it wasn't until a Gogo landed a knockout punch square on Cody's jaw. QT Marshall said he wants to whip Cody's ass in front of a live sold-out crowd, challenging to him to a strap match on July 7. That Wednesday will mark AEW's return to touring and the first show outside Daddy's place in Jacksonville in over a year. Earlier in the night, it was announced that July 7th show will be a special edition of Dynamite titled Road Rage. Rhodes quickly accepted the challenge and took off his bout, insisting they fight right then and there. Marshall then eventually took a cheap shot at Arn Anderson before being tackled by the Enforcer's son, Brock, which we'll touch on in a second. He and Cody will team up next week to take on Marshall and Aaron Solo. So it's a South Beach street fight. I will be totally, totally transparent. I could not care less. I, I really could not care. <laughs> I really could not care less. The whole Cody Rhodes, the factory, QT Marshall thing, I just don't care. I know that that's, they're trying, they're really trying to make QT Marshall into a character. I know they're trying to make QT Marshall turn into something that feels like it means something, but it just feels like another chapter of the Cody Rhodes show sometimes. And this is what is kind of a frustration for me for Dynamite is, and I don't want to come off as one of those people that is constantly bashing Cody Rhodes. Lord knows social media does that enough. But I feel in some of the criticisms, they're, they're very justified when it comes to Cody. And it feels like sometimes, again, Dynamite has these segments where it just feels like this Cody Rhodes so proper inside the Cody Rhodes universe. You know, you've got Cody Rhodes, you've got the Nightmare uh, family, you've got the factory, you've got Cody's various friends that turn on him, you've got Arn Anderson's son. It just, again, it feels like this weird Cody Rhodes soap opera and I it just feels very gratuitous and very I don't know I don't know I don't know who's getting over here Cody Rhodes is already over and he Anthony Gogo should have won at double or nothing because who benefited from Cody Rhodes winning nobody Cody Rhodes didn't benefit from winning because he's Cody Rhodes it doesn't matter Anthony Agogo, yes, and people go, yeah, but he knocked him out in the following edition of Dynamite, but who cares? The big match was at double or nothing, and he didn't win. He lost. And the QT Marshall thing, QT Marshall lost to Cody Rhodes at Blood and Guts, and it was convincing. Why do I have any interest in seeing the match again? What, because they've got straps this time? And Cody, I think Cody Rhodes will probably win. And then even if he doesn't, it's because Anthony Agogo gets involved. And then even if QT Marshall wins, that's 50-50 booking that we criticize WWE for. And again, it's just it's it's strange sometimes when you watch Dynamite and you watch these Cody Rhodes segments because they're so far removed from everything else that's going on. And we heard these reports of rumors about heat between the EVPs and all that kind of stuff. But it does feel really compartmentalized, doesn't it? It's like you've got... 
the you know Kenny Omega and the Bucks, and they're doing their thing on one side of Dynamite. On the other side, completely unrelated, no interaction whatsoever, is Cody and his little weird Rhodes universe with, with Arn Anson as his coach and Arn's son now and QT and his people, his students at the Nightmare Factory, which Cody partially owns. Cody's got his, uh, his Nightmare family. You've got Brandy Rhodes, who's now pregnant, and you've got Red Velvet, who kind of goes in and out, and you've got um, Shaquille O'Neal that comes in and goes out, and you've got the, the, the reality show. You've got Cody Rhodes and his friends of Snoop Dogg because he's on TBS's Go Big Show. It just, again, it feels like the Cody Rhodes show. I talk about this reality show that he's doing with Brandy Rhodes. It feels like we're watching that on Dynamite every week anyway. I, again, I just could not care. I just could not care less about this. I really couldn't. And uh, it's just, again, it's just odd. I just find it very odd. Uh, let's talk about Kenny Omega because Omega possibly might have uh, some injuries he's dealing with right now. AEW World Champion and Impact World Champion and AAA Mega Champion Kenny Omega is reportedly dealing with injuries. Omega is said to be hurting pretty bad right now, according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. In addition to a stomach virus from last week, Omega is suffering from a deep bone bruise near his tailbone, an athletic hernia, and normal wear and tear on his knees. Omega also sliced up his hand and needed seven stitches to close the wound when delivering a bout shot to Pac in the Double or Nothing main event on May 30th, which won't retain the World Championship over Pac and Orange Cassidy. The injury occurred during the fourth bout shot, as AEW bout is especially sharp. It was noted that Omega has been in a lot of pain uh, while getting through his recent top matches. He noted that at AEW Double or Nothing Fan Fest, there are days when he wakes up and walks around thinking it's maybe close to the time where he should hang up his boots and retire because his body is feeling worse. He also noted that having real fans in the crowd makes him feel a lot better when he's performing. Now, Omega is scheduled to defend his Impact World Championship tonight against Moose at the Against All Odds event, which is going to take place in Daly's Place in Jacksonville instead of Skyway Studios, where the rest of the pay-per-view will take place. The winner of that match will face Sammy Callahan at Slammiversary on July 17. Omega is then set to, to defend the AEW World Championship against Jungle Boy on the June 26 edition of Saturday Night Dynamite on TNT. Omega then has a third big match confirmed for the summer as he's going to defend the AAA Mega Championship against AEW and AAA star uh, Andrade El Idolo. That match is scheduled for the Triple Mania event on Saturday, August 14 in Mexico City. So it looks like at the moment, you know, Kenny Omega is dealing with quite a few injuries. And this has been, again... This is a report from The Observer, so I think when it comes to AEW stuff, it's quite factually accurate. And frankly, Omega's been talking about injuries that he has and has been dealing with for a while now. I think they missed out on that report, the issues that he's having with his shoulder. I remember Omega saying that he's got a partially torn labrum or something like that in his shoulder, and that eventually he needs surgery to fix it, but he has to go to a personal trainer, I think it's once or twice a week, and get some rehab on it, and that's allowing him to get through this. And Omega spoke about that he's been hurting for a while and basically said, look, I'm on the biggest run of my career at the moment in terms of being a world champion for three different promotions. I can't stop now, and I will get myself fixed eventually, but I can't stop now. But it does, you do get the feeling, don't you? You do get the feeling that eventually the wheels are going to fall off. He obviously, obviously needs some time off. And I know people will say, well, this is just part of wear and tear of being on the road. This is part of wear and tear of being a pro wrestler or being at the top of your game. Injuries happen and you have to fight through it and all that kind of stuff. I get that, but the list of, deal of injuries that he's having to deal with and the fact that Omega's openly talking about, man, some days I wake up and I want to retire. I hurt that much. And again, I know pro wrestlers will, from yesteryear, will hear this and go, well, so that was what I had in my day. Back in my day, I had to deal with this. Back in my day, I get that. I get it. But if you're Tony Khan and you're only a couple of years into this new promotion, you look at Omega, who is a top guy, and you say, you know, I, I, maybe you need to take some time off. Now, again, I would assume once Omega does eventually drop all of these championships, which he's, he will, then eventually maybe he has a couple of months off. And they can tie up as, you know, him going crazy because he lost all the championships and he has to reevaluate his career and all that kind of stuff. They can do that, and I think that makes sense. But, you know, he's got to be careful. Got to be careful. And I don't want to see Kenny Omega retire early because of injuries. I'd, just, I'd much rather have Omega take some time off and, uh, and then come back healthier and better than ever. But that schedule is relentless, and it's not stopping anytime soon. He's got three World Championship matches over the course of the next few months, and if he retains them, they're going to have to carry on. So it's it's a fascinating schedule that he's having to deal with, and just a relentless one, an absolutely relentless one. Speaking of Dynamite last night as well, we got some things announced for next week. We'll touch on these very, very briefly. Uh, we have... Um, 
Uh, Andrade Al Idolo in a sit-down interview with Jim Ross, which is certainly going to be interesting. Darby Allen, of course, is going to be facing Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page next week. Now, Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page said they wanted to face him against a partner of that, anyone that wasn't Sting, because apparently they're scared of a 62-year-old man. And the, stup- the sort of stupidity was then followed up even more by Darby Allen saying, I'll face you in a handicap match. Hmm, that's smart. I, I, I don't think Darby Allen will, frankly. I think there probably will be a tag team partner. As to who it is, time will only tell. Uh, but yeah, that, that whole thing is just so odd. <laughs> so odd. We want to face you in another tag team match, but not against Sting, but because we definitely can't beat a man in his 60s with spinal stenosis. Anyone else? Darby goes, okay, anyone else? I'll face you with nobody. Right, okay. But I still think he'll have a partner. And Wardlow has accepted Jake Hager's challenge to an MMA cage fight. So I guess this is going to be AEW's version of the Lion's Den, which I'm very excited to see. I was a big fan of the Lion's Den with Ken Shamrock and the Attitude Era in the late 1990s. Maybe we see some more of that. Brock Anderson. Yes, this is this is interesting. I mentioned the Cody Rhodes soap proper and the Cody Rhodes reality show continues. Well, Cody Rhodes will have backup next week on Dynamite. During Friday's Dynamite, it was announced that Brock Anderson, the son of Arn Anderson, will make his AEW debut in a tag team match alongside Cody Rhodes on the June 18 episode of Dynamite. Cody and Brock will team up to face QT Marshall and Aaron Solo in the never-ending Nightmare Factory versus uh, Nightmare, uh, the Nightmare Family versus Factory storyline. It was reported back in January that Brock was training to become a pro wrestler. Anderson played high school football and was the 94th ranked graduating linebacker in North Carolina and the 904th ranked graduating linebacker in the nation. Now, Brock did get physical in the segment, taking down Marshall and catching him with some punches after Marshall hit him a hit arm with a strap. As to how well he will be, look, if he's only been training since January, I don't know. But look, he is an athlete, and those athletes tend to have a better time adjusting. Time will only tell. The thing that I found fascinating is talk about a guy that looks exactly like his father. I mean, dead on. Brock Anderson looks exactly like his dad. There is no no DNA test, no paternity test is needed there. Arn Anderson is definitely the father <laughs> of that kid. There is no doubt about that. He looks exactly like him. It's literally like Arn Anderson got that face app and they just de-aged him like, I don't know, 40 years, 20 years. He looks exactly like Arn Anderson. And if he's half as good a worker as his dad, then AEW's on to a winner. So, uh, you know, interesting. And having these second generation stars, look, that, that they've always proven most of the time, not all the time, you know, Sean Stasiak, all that kind of stuff. Um, Bruno Sammartino's son, David, and, you know, uh, Bill Watts' son, all that kind of stuff. Not always work, but sometimes they do. And look, if he, again, if he's half as good a wrestler as his dad, then AEW's absolutely on to a winner there. So that's, that's very exciting as well. It's a reason to tune in next week, right? Uh, Mark Henry, we'll touch on this briefly, has confirmed that he will wrestle for AEW. He announced it during uh, yesterday's edition of the Busted Open Radio Show um, because he revealed when discussing Sting and Darby Allen that he had insp- that had inspired him to get back into the ring. Henry went on to say he would wrestle for AEW and it would happen sooner rather than later, possibly. Maybe is he Darby Allen's tag team partner next week? He said, quote, Sting has made me feel like a 50, uh, feel like 50 is not old. Sting is one of those guys. And if there's anyone out there in this world, I'd appreciate it if you tweeted this out. Sting is a credit to the elder statesman in wrestling. He has made me feel that there's a lot I can still offer, not just behind the scenes, but possibly in the ring. I don't know when that's going to be, but I've said it before. I want to wrestle again before it's all said and done. I want to wrestle in four decades and that time is upon us. I don't know when it's going to be, but it's going to happen and it's going to be at AEW. And I'm excited about it. I think Sting is primarily the reason that I'm making this kind of announcement. He's motivated me and made me feel that, man, it's not too late. So Mark Henry confirming he is going to step back into the ring. Um, look, Mark Henry still has obviously something to offer and there is there is room. I know people will get angry about this, but there is room for those nostalgia wrestlers and those legends to come back if it's in the right way. If it's done properly, I never have a problem with it because it's good business. WWE, again, I never have a problem with it if it's done the right way. But when you have Goldberg coming back, winning the Universal Championship and beating The Fiend, that's when you go, "Eh, I'm not sure about that. When it's Mark Henry coming back and putting over a younger talent, whether it's Mick Foley in the late 2000s coming back and putting over Randy Orton, putting over Edge, putting over whoever he worked with, that's, that's how it's meant to be done. Mark Henry can make someone. 
So what, there isn't a problem with him coming back. There's an issue when he comes back and starts beating people. Now, of course, people will say, well, what about Sting? He pinned Scorpio Sky. Different reality. There was only ever going to be one outcome of that match, and there was only needed to be one outcome of that match because that was about getting Darby Allin over, not Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page. They did get over by proxy of just facing Sting. So different realities there. I mean, people have to look at these things in context. Finally, Tony Khan has spoken about Triple H's comments on that media call, that media call this week. Tony Khan made his weekly appearance on the Busted Open radio show. In the wake of Triple H's controversial comments on the NXT takeover media call, Khan addressed some of what Triple H said. While he takes no issue in Triple H believing his product was the best, which I don't think anyone did, Khan did think Triple H saying the best female performers in the world are either in WWE or want to be was false. Khan said, quote, everyone is building their own roster. There's going to be good feelings about the people they work with. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying you think you have the best show or the best company. I think where people got offended yesterday is when he said everyone wants to work here. That was like people are confusing the two things. If you want to say like, hey, I think my show is the best. I think my product is the best. There's nothing wrong with that. Like you should feel that way. That's good. But when you say anybody of value wants to work here, that's not true. It's crazy. There's plenty of people who work in AEW that have no interest in working there. And I think the champion made it pretty clear yesterday with what she tweeted. Karma is referring to AEW Women's World Champion Britt Baker, who responded to Triple H's uh, comments by simply tweeting a photo of her and Thunder Rosa. And Thunder Rosa essentially followed up on this as well. And I think Tony Khan, in fairness, has knocked at He's now hit the nail on the head there. That's the analogy I'm looking for. That... That's, I think, the thing that people were offended by is not the fact that Triple H is saying, oh, we have the best product and I believe in my product. And we've got the best people here. You should say that. But when you say everyone wants to work here, that's not true. You know, a lot of people do. I say that all the time. A lot of people get into pro wrestling eventually to work with WWE or to get to WWE because that's what they grew up in. But a lot of people don't as well. And some people, even if initially when they got into pro wrestling, that's what they did. I think about getting into pro wrestling for that changes over time when they hear the stories of WWE or they see their friend the way their friends were treated or they go to an AEW or they go to an Impact or Ring of Honor NWA New Japan they like it there and they have no interest in leaving so the idea of, oh everyone wants to come here it's narrow-minded, it's narrow-sighted. And I think Tony Khan was right with that one. But look, guys, as always, this is just one man's opinion. What are your thoughts on all of these AEW news stories we've spoken about today? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I'll do my best to respond and reply to all of your comments. Really enjoy interacting with you guys, talking about AEW, WWE, Impact Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, all things pro wrestling here on the channel. So be sure to get involved in the community. Drop a comment below. All opinions are welcome. If you have enjoyed this video, please do smash a like on the like button too. It really does help us out here on YouTube. Go up the rankings and get into people's recommendation feeds if they haven't seen our videos previously. But most importantly, if you haven't already please do subscribe to wrestle news 365 you can do that by clicking the bottom right hand corner of the screen right now or if you wait a few seconds there'll be a subscribe button at the end of this video along with another video for you to watch thank you very much for watching listening streaming or have you come across this video today and i'll speak for you again very very soon Hey guys, thank you for watching, listening, streaming, or however you come across this video today. Be sure to click on the video on the right there to watch our next video, or click the bottom there to subscribe, or the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you again very soon.